So today we're going to cover powertrain theory in general. Uh, we're going to jump a little bit into uh, uh, EV design and what that means. And uh, we'll go, we'll talk a little bit about drivetrain, about cooling. And uh, yeah, and then we'll go into questions after that. Also, in between sections, I'll, I'll make, do a pause to see if you guys have questions about specific areas. All right, so powertrain. Uh, what is a powertrain system? Oh, so, okay, so I'm going to be asking questions. Uh, you guys can either uh, type your answer in the chat or if, if you have a quick Actually, let's, let's just keep it in the chat. I, I feel like six or seven people will, will answer at the same time. Um, what is the goal of a powertrain system? Why does a car need a powertrain system? OK, to deliver power, deliver power to the wheels to move, generate and deliver power, provide power to the, to the wheels. OK, these are good answers. But I like Jesvin's the most because it's the simplest. You need a powertrain system to move the car. Without it, the, the car is a nice sitting paperweight. Uh, but that's it. That's really the the only goal of, of this massive system is to just spin the wheels and move the car forward. Um, now, let's think about uh, what that means. So you have, you have a a person sitting in a car and they press on a pedal and then that pedal somehow has to translate to wheels turning in the rear of the car and to do that it has to go through a, a, a system now in a combustion car uh, that used to be the pedal would actuate the throttle body on the intake which would uh, in conjunction with the ECU uh, decide how much uh, the engine will create in power by combining the right amount of air and fuel uh, and spark and all that. And that delivered a certain amount of torque over a certain period of time coming out of the engine into the wheels. Uh, and this was tunable both in the design of the components like the intake and the exhaust, but also through uh, smaller to, uh, tuning through the ECU and stuff like that. And that's how you change things like power uh, and torque with respect to RPM. Now, in an electric vehicle, you don't have these things. You don't have a combustion process. In fact, it's a lot simpler because you just have electricity that you have to deliver to a motor. The motor is what spins and in turn spins your wheels. Well, if uh, that's the case, um, what do we need to do to, to make that system work? Well, we need a source of power or electricity. Uh, that's, that source of electricity is in the rules known as an accumulator. Uh, they, they don't call it a battery pack or anything like that because they, you, you don't have to use batteries. You can use capacitors, which are a different form of energy storage, but uh, the accumulator is just a, a general word used for any energy storage device on the vehicle. You can have more than one. You can have one. Uh, it's, it's up to the designers. From there, it has to go to the motor. But uh, if you imagine you have a little battery in a tiny little motor uh, and, and you stick a little fan on that motor and you connect the battery to the motor, once you connect the battery to the motor, it either it's either on and if you disconnect it, it's off, right? Yeah, yeah. the motor doesn't change in RPM. It doesn't change in uh, torque. It doesn't change in anything. It's just on and off. But in reality, when you're driving, you're not always just pressing uh, fully on the gas and off the gas. You're, you're a lot of times you're in between and you want the motor to supply you power uh, to the wheels, not in a, in, a, in a binary fashion, but in a more analog fashion. So uh, once that electricity goes from the battery, I'm going to put that in quotes, it has to go through a system that modulates the power output to the motor. And that's the, it's, it's called the motor controller. Now a motor controller is usually made of two parts. 
uh, the, the most important part of a motor controller is the inverter, which, depending on your setup, will change your uh, uh, DC power to AC or vice versa. I think one, uh, one type is called an inverter, the other type is called something else. But essentially, we have uh, an accumulator has batteries in them, and those batteries provide one type of electricity. But depending on the motor you use, you will need uh, to uh, you will need to invert that type of electricity to the other type in order to make it work. Or if you're using an AC power source and an AC motor, then you wouldn't get an inverter. But what the motor controller does is, first of all, it inverts that system. But it also has a, a control system within it that allows you to translate input signal from the driver pressing on the gas to something, uh, to a certain amount of uh, current uh, that the motor will then use to spin the wheels. So in other words, when you press on the gas, the current at the motor is changing. But the current in the, in the battery pack uh, is what... Uh, the current in the battery pack can can um, uh, can fluctuate quite a bit, and it fluctuates based on the, what the motor controller tells it to do. Uh, from there, uh, past the motor controller, you have the motor itself. The motor is uh, it's an electric motor, so it uses uh, electromagnetism to spin a shaft. So you have you have uh, uh, copper windings on the inside, you have magnets, and uh, it using uh, an electromagnetic field, it pushes on the spinning component of the motor while the housing stays in place. Uh, there are different designs. There are AC motors, there are DC motors. I don't really fully understand the difference, but uh, some are, they're both used heavily in all types of industries. Uh, you guys have to, I think in, the, in our document, we kind of looked at uh, some and the other because uh, if you have like an AC motor, your accumulator has to be a certain design. If you have a DC motor, it has to be a different design. I believe we ended up with an AC motor, but that was uh, it wasn't due to the fact that we uh, we picked one or the other for a reason. It was due to other factors. So let's talk about those other factors. Uh, when we talk about a combustion vehicle, what's one of the first things uh, that comes up in our minds in terms of performance of a, of a combustion powertrain system? Like, what are the variables that we really think of a lot? Torque, that's good, Bernardin. Horsepower curve, horsepower, any more? OK, well, all those answers are pretty good. Uh, it's really the power curve. The power curve is the, is the big one. What is the power curve? A power curve is a graph, essentially, where the x-axis is RPM and the y-axis is um, torque, okay? And uh, an engine, a normal combustion engine, will deliver different amounts of torque out of its output shaft at different RPM. That is how a motor behaves. There is no... Um, that's really what you care about. A, a whole engine is only there to provide a torque out of an output shaft, which you then take to the wheels. And an electric motor does the same exact thing. Uh, same exact thing. It just provides a torque out of an output shaft, which you then translate to the wheels. So the thing is, uh, in combustion engines, this amount of torque output is not constant throughout the RPM range. It, it changes. And that change is dependent on your uh, intake design, your exhaust design, your uh, fuel tuning, your spark tuning, a whole bunch of things. Uh, luckily for us, electric motors are actually a, a much more different in that regard, and they're actually much more constant. They're not perfectly constant, but if you look at a curve of a combustion engine, it looks like a mountain, but if you look at the curve of a, an electric motor, for the most part, it's quite flat, and that's very good because that means that if your driver has his foot, let's say, halfway on the throttle, and he's going down a very long straight, and the RPM is picking up, uh, the amount of torque getting to the wheels is fairly constant. It's not increasing 
at different rates. And that means the car becomes a lot more predictable in that sense. Now, like I said before, uh, the x-axis is RPM, the y-axis is torque. And we, are, we all know just by watching like videos online that people talk a lot about horsepower. Well, horsepower is just a function of torque and RPM. Uh, it's not another variable that, that you have to measure. You can just calculate it by measuring torque and RPM. Uh, it is a unit. Yes, it's a unit of work. Anyways, um, so the point is, uh, when you're deciding on a motor, the only thing you can go on is uh, your power curve. Oh, sorry, your, your torque curve. Uh, there's nothing else for you to decide on in terms of performance. Now, you have to remember that part selection, uh, just like anything else, is dependent on your goals. Uh, in our capstone, we set our goals to be, uh, you know, reliability, drivability, blah, blah, blah. And we also set uh, goals like uh, having enough information about the motor before purchasing. And it just so happened that MRAX was the only company around that had plenty of information for a motor that's that could uh, deliver uh, uh, power that we were looking at, like a... a uh, amounts of power that we wanted and that's why it's such a MRAX is such a popular brand among FSAE teams is because it's really designed for our specification as well as maybe like small vehicles and motorcycles and stuff but we fit in that category there are other options out there but those other options didn't provide us with much uh, information and they're you know buying a motor is an expensive thing so uh, you can't just uh, buy it and then discover things about it. So, yeah, uh, we had picked the MRAX 208. Uh, it's fairly small. Uh, the specifications online made it seem like it's uh, uh, slightly underpowered, but uh, because it uses less electricity and it's lighter, uh, if you can make a, a fairly light car, you, 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 it becomes advantageous. Otherwise, you can use the MRAX 228, which is uh, heavier, but also more powerful. Uh, right. So you have electricity in the accumulator. It goes through the motor controller and then goes through to the motor. From there, it has to go to the wheels. But motors can go, can go up only to a certain RPM, as we would know from our torque curve. And uh, they will provide a certain amount of torque. Now, do we want that amount of torque at the wheels? Do we want that amount of RPM at the wheels? Usually the answer is no. So you can't just take a motor and weld a shaft onto it to the wheels because you're going to most likely stall. You need a bit more torque at the wheels because you're driving a heavy vehicle. And that's where the drivetrain system comes in. The drivetrain system is simply a way to convert RPM and torque into one or the other in order to make your car drive more uh, uh, to, uh, your car to drive more the way you want it to. Now, what we did to understand what kind of uh, gear ratios we wanted is we used lab simulation because lab simulation allows you to to run the same uh, track over and over and over with different uh, gear ratios, and it tells you which one is uh, will give you the fastest lap time, and that's what you're looking for. Now, are simulations perfect? No. Why aren't they perfect? Well, the one we used uh, uh, is optimum lap, and optimum lap doesn't uh, do a whole car. It only does uh, like a point mass, which is going around a track. A point mass doesn't have body roll. Uh, it doesn't have uh, pitch and, and yaw and, and all that. It's just like, imagine you took a bowling ball and you just kind of pushed it around the Michigan track. There's a lot missing there. It also doesn't account for shift times. And it doesn't account for, uh, you know, driver error and stuff like that. It, it gives you a very idealized uh, estimate of what, your, what a certain car could do around the track. Um, so, 
we uh, I mentioned shifting, and that would be the next thing. Uh, in normal combustion cars, you usually have a whole bunch of gears, and you need them because if you stayed it, when you accelerate from from start, you need a lot of torque to, to push all that weight. You, you have a lot of inertia you need to overcome. But when you're going really, really, uh, when you want to go really fast, being in first gear and having all that torque will proportionately give you too little wheel RPM. That's just how gear ratios work. And that's why you need all these gears. With electric motors, it's the same exact idea. The electric motors have a certain amount of torque and they have a certain amount of uh, RPM. And if you want to stay within a certain amount of uh, RPM range to get, let's say, very high torque or something like that, uh, you might need uh, gears. Now, luckily, like I said, um, uh, electric motors have a very flat torque curve, which means that whether you're at, let's say, 1,000 RPM or 8,000 RPM, you will be getting about the same torque out of the motor. And that might mean that you can get rid of a of an uh, of a uh, a gearbox and only pick one uh, uh, one gear ratio that can kind of suit you both, both for uh, launch and for uh, high speed. You won't get the the best thing in the world if, let's say, you have a two gear uh, a two speed gearbox. You might be able to get really high torque and then really high speed. But now you have to either incorporate one that you buy or you have to build it yourself. And gearbox design is a, is a thing of its own. Look at cars like ETS. They're very light. They only have one gear and they, they do very well. Uh, look at a car like ours. We have six gears in a stock engine. We never use the sixth. Uh, we could, I mean, we do use the first, but perhaps we can get rid of it. If we had a very light car, it's uh, much harder to stall, and thus you could probably get rid of the, the really torquey uh, gear ratios. Point is, it's something that you might have to look at when you, uh, when you build your car through lab simulation to see if you would be faster with a gearbox. You wouldn't be faster with a gearbox. You would have to estimate the weight of the gearbox. You'd have to estimate how long it takes to shift and uh, how often you have to shift during a lap because if you have to shift quite a bit, that will take concentration from the driver away from driving and more into shifting, and that will slow down his lap time. These are things that you have to look at uh, and see if they meet your goal, your design goals or not. If your design goal to have a reliable car, would a gearbox be something you want? That was a question I, I would like an answer. A yes or no, that's it. There you go, no. You don't want a gearbox if, you're, if your goal is to be reliable and simple and light. Anyways, so electricity is in the accumulator. It goes into the motor controller. From there, it goes into the uh, motor. And out, out of the shaft of the motor, it goes to the drivetrain system and into the wheels. That's the, the from A to B, where the electricity goes. Now you have peripherals on top of that. Uh, for example, like we said before, the driver has to press on the gas, on the gas pedal, in order to deliver uh, a signal to the uh, to the wheels. Essentially, um, that signal. First of all, how do you pick it up? What measures that signal at the at the pedal? How do you send that signal uh, to the back of the car? And once it gets there, where does it go? So I said that the motor controller is where you um, is where the, the power is modulated. Now the motor controller we picked, uh, I believe, has an internal system that accepts this uh, the, the the value that you give it from the gas pedal, and we'll change it to a torque value. But you guys have to set up uh, what that means. So if you press 100% on the gas, you have to know how much, how many amps the motor needs to get at that position, and how much at 50% and how much at 0%. Uh, the, the controller we picked, it was designed apparently for the MRAX motor. Uh, 
So you know, it has actually free software you can download and check out uh, uh, to to see what it is you can play around with with that controller to make it to make it work. Um, what else? So you have to you have to press on the gas, and, and you need specific sensors that are outlined in the rules to make that happen. Uh, you need oh yeah. So another thing is the accumulator has a whole bunch of rules surrounding it for safety, uh, and this is where the battery management system comes in. So we spoke about all these components, but one that we didn't talk about yet is the battery management system. Um, batteries, you can think of a battery as like a little bottle of water. And as you uh, use up a battery, that the water inside of it is disappearing. Um, the electrons here are, are the water in question. So think of a, an accumulator as a, a big, a 24 pack of, of water, okay, uh, of water bottles. And for some reason, you have all the caps open at the top, and you know it's slowly evaporating. The water's evaporating, but because you have the box half in the shade and half in the sun, the right side of the box is evaporating way quicker than the left. So uh, it also just so happens that the box is sitting exactly in the middle of a ledge, and the shaded side is hanging in the air. Well, one day you're going to have so little water in the in the, in the side that's evaporating quicker, that the whole accumulator is going to topple over and spill water everywhere. Now imagine instead of it's, it being water, imagine that being um, uh, highly flammable lithium. And instead of it evaporating, you're using the, the cells at different rates uh, through the, let's say, bad circuitry or something, or just bad manufacturing of the cells themselves. And uh, then some cells are, are at like two volts and some cells are at four volts and your system explodes. It's a big deal. So what the battery management system does is it takes care of that for you by making sure that all the batteries are always discharging the same amount. They all have the same capacity as they're discharging and they all have the same voltage as they're discharging. This is very important for the health of your batteries, especially when uh, you end up buying God knows how many, and you're spending thousands on batteries. You can't uh, you can't afford to destroy a whole batch of them every time uh, you charge wrong or you uh, you you test the car and something like I don't know a wire got loose and a whole chunk of the the accumulator isn't uh, discharging anymore. These are very important things to to keep in mind. The battery management system is the 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 way you do that if it senses any uh discrepancy between the voltages or anything like that it shuts the car off and that will even if you don't finish endurance you're gonna thank your lucky stars because you don't have to pay another two thousand dollars in in batteries and have to rebuild it from the whole accumulator from scratch another thing that a battery management system a good one a good battery management system does is it monitors uh, battery temperatures as well. Batteries, as they discharge, get hot. And if you don't keep them cool, by rules, if you pass 60 degrees Celsius, you have to shut the car off. And again, uh, that's for safety because if batteries get too hot, they can explode. And if they explode, you have a bomb strapped to the back of the driver. It's probably even, it's probably even more dangerous than a fuel tank in a combustion car. Because at least fuel, uh, it, uh, like uh, the, what really combusts in fuel is the vapor. It's not the actual liquid. So if you can keep everything sealed, it's pretty easy to contain the, the fire. While with a battery, if, if uh, one touches, if the lithium actually touches oxygen, it can ignite pretty quickly. And, the, and that'll go to the rest of the, the batteries. Um, so yeah, this is why you need you absolutely 100% need a battery management system because you only charge through it and you discharge through it. So in reality, if I understand correctly, the way the electricity still goes from the accumulator to the controller, but you have the battery management system monitoring everything at the same time. And that 
is connected to your shutdown circuit, which is also outlined in the rules. And if the batteries show any any form of uh, malfunctioning, the car will shut off um, accordingly. The uh, the BMS that we chose was the uh, Orion. Uh, apparently, it's a company that makes some really high quality BMSs. They're like uh, the industry standard, and they offer BMSs of different sizes. They're actually quite expensive. I think a few thousand dollars. But uh, this is something that you really need, or else you're going to be buying a few thousand dollars worth of batteries every time. Uh, the Orion comes in different sizes because they can only monitor so many cells. Uh, and the bigger ones can monitor more cells. Now, the rules specify uh, how you're supposed to measure the voltage of your cells and how you're supposed to measure the temperature of your cells. So we picked the very biggest one, but we kind of picked it willy-nilly. It should, it should be enough to, to measure as many cells as the rules require, but you might be able to uh, get away with using a smaller one, which will use less space in the car, which is important. Um, but you absolutely 100% need a BMS. It's very important. Right, so we talked about, so we know that there's an accumulator, a motor, a motor controller, and a BMS. These are the four main components of a, drive of a powertrain system. Uh, the rest are kind of just like little bits and pieces that you have to add on, uh, you know, like wires and, and uh, like maybe like a, another control board for like other systems that are also working with the powertrain system. Uh, Jesvin asked before the meeting about the, uh, the energy meter. So an energy meter is a rules mandated piece that you also have to include in your, in your system. And that measures how much uh, power you're using. The reason you need that is because, first of all, you can't go above a certain power output from your accumulator. Uh, you can't go over a certain voltage. You can't go over a certain uh, uh, energy uh, density and stuff like that. Not energy density, no. Uh, but yeah, you can't go over a certain voltage. And the only way that they can monitor this on the track is by having an energy meter. That's also connected to the... Um, shutdown circuit and if you exceed the voltage if you exceed the 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 current or anything like that it'll shut the, the, the circuit off now the uh, energy meter i believe is supplied by the competition at competition all you have to do is design a place for it what i would suggest and i think what teams do is they actually buy their own energy meter the same model that the one that they use at competition because first of all you want to be monitoring your own stuff during testing and also you want it for safety and third of all if you make a uh, if you make a, a shutdown circuit where an energy meter can sit but then you don't install one that means you have an open circuit so i believe you probably should buy uh, uh, an energy meter the same one that they would use a competition but i believe a competition that they, they give you their own because they don't want you to uh to obviously cheat and and uh, and like play around with your energy meter to make it look fake. They also use the energy meter to understand your efficiency score after endurance because it can tell how much uh, juice is left in the batteries. And that's that's really the, uh, the, the energy meter. I don't really know what it looks like. I think there's a drawing online on FSE online, but it's not a very good, it's not a very good drawing. Anyways, um, so let's talk about cells for a second. The, the cells themselves, uh, the ones we picked, are Samsung 21700 cells. So in the world of uh, battery cells, they, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, a lot of them come in a cylindrical shape, just like the ones you use in your remote on your TV or in your Game Boys and whatnot. Um, but they also come in different lengths and diameters. Now, I said 21700. That is the, the form factor of the batteries we picked. 21 is 21 millimeter diameter. 700 is 70 millimeters in length. That extra zero, I don't know why it's there. Another very popular size is uh, 18650, 
So 18 is 18 millimeters in diameter and 65 millimeters in length. Uh, a lot of teams use 18650s. Another type of uh, uh, thing is uh, pouch cells. Pouch cells are rectangular in shape and they're very flat and thin and they actually stack very well. They fit better in a box than the, the cylindrical cells which have space in between them. But the problem with pouch cells as we found, is that they usually have less energy density, so less energy per kilogram than the, the circular cells. And uh, they don't allow us to discharge enough current as, as we, we want. So what do I mean by that? Other than capacity, uh, batteries have a few different things that are important. 21700 batteries have a, a nominal voltage of 3.7 volts so when you're using them they're usually around 3.7 volts in reality when you fully charge a, a, a 27 uh, 21700 battery it's at it's near 4 to 4.2 volts and as you start using it it drops to 3.7 and it keeps dropping to about about i don't know 2.5 volts where you would probably discharge the whole thing now, it's not a good idea to go all the way that far. So you guys actually have to figure out uh, how much you should charge it and how much you should discharge it. Because it's not healthy for a lithium ion battery to be fully charged and fully discharged. Uh, you actually wanna charge it somewhere at 80% and discharge it somewhere at like, let's say 40%. If it goes too low in voltage or too high, uh, you're actually damaging the cell a little bit on the inside. And it loses, capacity as you keep doing that cycle of charge and discharge. Um, if you look at your phone, for instance, when you charge up your phone to 100% and then you let it discharge to like 1%, uh, that's not very good for the battery to begin with. But also, uh, phone designers have uh, um, programmed like little uh, gates where when your phone says 100%, it's not actually the battery that's filled up at 100%. It's filled up close probably, but not too much. And when it's at zero, there's actually still some reserve battery left. Um, the downside of setting up your own uh, your own limits as to how much you can fill and, and uh, empty the battery is that now you might need a bigger amount of batteries to get the same capacity since you, you can't use the full capacity of the batteries anymore, which means you have a, a heavier system. So you guys have to look at how much you're willing to use up in terms of battery capacity when you charge and discharge and how many extra batteries you'll need uh, to, to have the capacity you want. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we calculated a certain capacity for an endurance race and that was something that Ariel and mostly Ariel did honestly uh, through Optimum Lab. So if you, if you look at the capstone report, you will be able to see uh, how he went about doing that, but it was somewhere around, I like a very safe estimate was seven kilowatt hours, which is uh, a bit more than what most teams run, but uh, better be safe than sorry, to be honest. Um, yeah, another other stuff that affects cells is uh, temperature, ambient temperature. When it's super cold outside and the battery is super cold, it will discharge way quicker than a, a warm, a room temp battery. And if it's hot, it also loses capacity. Uh, so most, most batteries are designed for to be at their optimal range in room temperature, so 25%. And they lose a bit of capacity when they're near 60 degrees. Uh, but uh, after a certain temperature, they actually drop very quickly. And that's something that is different for every battery. I believe that the Samsung can go up to 80 degrees without being too affected. Uh, a cold battery will be affected much more than a hot battery. So below zero degrees, you actually get a huge drop in, in uh, capacity uh, from room temperature. So you only, have a, you only have 20 degrees to play with below room temp, but you have like 60 degrees to play with above room temp. Although by rules, you have to keep the cells, every cell below 60 Celsius. Anyways. So these are all things that you have to worry about because let's say you had you were at Michigan and it was a cold day at Michigan. 
Well, the batteries will start to at a colder temperature, so they won't have enough capacity. And yes, they do get warmer as you start going through uh, the track and all that. But you have to you have to just be careful to know if you have enough starting capacity. Um, yeah, and like I said before, I'll, I'll answer your question, Kyle, in a minute. Uh, and like I said before, uh, the the voltage of a battery isn't constant throughout its discharge. It, it it starts up high and it goes down low. So you have to be careful because if you design a battery pack to output a certain amount of current at a certain amount of voltage, in reality, that voltage is going to be changing and thus the current is going to be changing. And, and ideally, if you can mo model uh, uh, a battery as a function of, of uh, voltage over capacity, and then you know that you're going to be using, let's say, 7 kilowatt hours, you could probably get a better idea of how much current you can use as a result. In other words, as, you're, as you discharge your battery, you might have to start driving slower because you can't supply the same current or something like that. This is something that I think the electrical people will be a bit more familiar with uh, because they know electricity. And now Kyle asks, is the balance charging done through the battery management system? So through a separate charger connected to the balance lead. Each lead is connected to the cell. That's a very good question, Kyle. I'm not exactly sure. I believe you do it through the battery management system, but one of the rules uh, states that you need to have a certain type of charger, which is um, like it has to be rule compliant. Some teams make their own charger and some teams buy a charger. And I think... Whether it goes through the, the battery management system or not, it'll also have a balancing, um, it, it needs to have a balancing feature. So uh, if, it, if it has to go through the, the, the BMS, then the BMS would probably take care of that. If it has to be separate, then it definitely needs a balancing system within it. Uh, yeah, you'd have to check the rules on that and you'd have to see the, uh, the Orion spec sheet to see if it if it supports like charging or if it's only there for discharge but yeah bms is purely a monitoring system it's it, it doesn't it doesn't uh run actual like a lot of amps through it i don't think i don't think uh, so you guys will have to do more research on that right so that's that's mostly what it is about cells uh, i'll talk about a little bit about the how everything was uh, like the, the, about the accumulator. So like I said before, a, uh, an accumulator will have a, a lot of cells in it, not just one battery, but a whole bunch connected together. Now, we know from basic circuits that if you connect two batteries in series, you add up their voltages. Am I correct? Oh shit! There's a whole bunch of different questions. Sorry, I uh, my uh, my uh, scroll thing didn't go down. Uh, I'll, I'll okay. So I'll continue the thing about the the batteries in a minute. Does the BMS prevent? Kyle asked, does the BMS prevent the car from using batteries below that minimum voltage? The voltage might be okay without load, but it can sag past the critical minimum and damage the batteries. Uh, yes, it, it can it can damage the batteries. Uh, I believe. I would I would assume the BMS has that feature, but I think it would it would be something that you have to set. So, so in other words, you have to decide on what um, voltage it has to cut off at. I don't think the rules specify anything like that. Also, Matthew says, couldn't we just only use the full battery capacity during actual events and during testing just keep it within forty to eighty percent? You could. That's a very good point. You could do that. Um, yeah, I like. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with doing that because uh, filling up the batteries just once for endurance, uh, it, it really won't damage the batteries very much, if at all. Um, but you have to think of it uh, like this: when, when you're doing all your tests and you're doing your, uh, uh, you're going to be doing endurance simulations. Uh, you're going to be doing a lot of those, right? So you're going to be running your battery between forty to eighty percent, anyways. And if you're going to be doing that and your car already finishes endurance, 
uh, at that amount, then why why change something in the uh, endurance event that matters? Because we all know that uh, you know uh, problems happen from things that you haven't tested, and changing anything right before the the big event can be catastrophic. So uh, your that method is a a good way to have to run a fairly to, to run a battery pack that can just finish endurance and uh, keep it healthy by only charging it partially during the, the smaller events. Uh, but you just have to be careful because you have to do uh, uh, endurance simulations during testing and you have to do a, a whole lot of those and you need to make sure that you're keeping your batteries healthy there. Uh, Dagmir, I, sorry, I hope I said your name correctly. So uh, the temperature affects Discharge rate and capacity. Yes, it does. It does both. Uh, and then Bernard said yes. Michael said yes. And then Kyle said the battery has to be balanced to a storage voltage for longer periods, right? Uh, yeah, I believe uh, battery manufacturers specify uh, storage um, uh, conditions. So like what voltage and uh, if you have to top it off and stuff like that. They even tell you that you actually have to discharge the batteries maybe once a, every once in a while and then recharge them. Uh, but that's different for every manufacturer. Which, by the way, if you're going to buy batteries, buy them from a reputable source and buy them from a reputable company because a lot of people buy dead batteries, rebrand them, and sell them as new ones. So if you see a really great deal on a whole bunch of batteries, it might not be such a great deal. All right, so as I was saying, uh, batteries inside of a box, uh, if you put them in series, you add up their voltages. If you put them in parallel, uh, you increase the capacity of, of this system. Uh, if you have them in, vo in series, I don't believe that you increase the, the capacity. You, it's like you have a, a battery. Imagine you have 1,000 milliamp hour, a 1,000 milliamp hour battery at 3 volts, and you put two in series, it becomes 6 volts, but it's still 3 uh, 1,000 milliamp hours. So um, the reason why I say this is because the motor needs a certain amount of voltage supplied to it and a certain amount of current. Now, the voltage is constant. The current is what changes. When you design your accumulator, you need it to match that voltage. The motor controller, uh, by working as an inverter, can actually... Um, change the voltage to, to, to make the match, but the, the more, the bigger the difference between your of, uh, accumulator voltage and your motor voltage, the less efficient the motor controller becomes. So you have more losses in the system, unless you need a bigger battery pack. So your goal with the accumulator design is to make the, the, the batteries, to put the batteries in, in series and in parallel in such a way as to get uh, the closest output voltage as what the motor needs. And uh, once you do that, you then keep adding sections uh, in parallel to the container to get the, the, the final, uh, uh, what should we call it? The final capacity that you want for the whole accumulator. Now that is a function of battery voltage, which remember, battery voltage is not constant, but it changes throughout the discharge. And that will change the capacity. It'll change the um, the output voltage and all that. So you have to be very careful when you design these things. Now we did a, a sheet that I, that also was posted on the drive. I think Erica knows where I posted it on the drive, and it has a whole bunch of tabs. And one of the tabs is called the cell calculator. And under cell calculator, we have a bunch of tables. One of which uh, is the table we use to calculate what kind of uh, setup we wanted. And that has inputs like cell voltage, and it calculates like voltage per segment and blah, blah, blah. And it sees if these are, uh, uh, they pass rules and stuff like that. So you guys can and can check those out. It's not the cleanest uh, sheet in the world. So maybe one day we can go back and look at that if you guys want. But uh, uh, it, it shows uh, which setup we decided to go with. And that same setup, by the way, is explained in the capstone project. So if if you're having a hard time checking it through the Excel sheet, check it through the project, the, the document. Um, yeah, 
Now, you, you put all those batteries in an accumulator. The accumulator is really your only safety device between you and, and chemical burn. Uh, there's a lot of rules on the accumulator container, and you guys have to follow those to the letter. We designed a bunch of the, the parts, uh, a bunch of, like, a chunk of the container, but there's a lot of small things that we still haven't figured out. So that's something that you guys will, will have to, to, to figure out in your design. Like... Uh, the box itself uh, has to carry the batteries, but it also has to keep them fixed. And uh, you have to try and dissipate the heat from the batteries. Some teams claim that you don't actually need to cool the batteries since you don't run them for long enough to do that, even in endurance. But through our calculations, we feel like you definitely do. Uh, and you obviously don't want water touching your your batteries so you, you have to do do it in such a way so that even if it's raining you can cool the batteries without shorting anything uh, which is actually in my opinion one of the more difficult things to do uh, in the car it's uh, accumulator cooling is going to be very difficult we came up with a uh, a very very rudimentary solution that hasn't been uh, analyzed in any way but it's it's a start and uh, um, it's essentially you dip all of the batteries in a, a potting compound, like a silicone, which after it sets, it becomes like a rubber. And it's designed to, um, it has a very high heat transfer rate. So if you cool the, the, an aluminum box, if, if, you're, if your accumulator container is made out of aluminum and the batteries are, uh, are expelling heat into this medium, which is then touching the, the, the aluminum, you can then... Uh, 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 cool the box from the outside and do it that way. Uh, but how much you need to cool, I have no idea because we don't really understand how much the batteries will discharge in terms of heat throughout a whole endurance event. That is something you guys definitely need to do as a real life test. And I've outlined a way to do that for one cell so you don't have to buy all the cells and do it. Uh, also in the report, in the appendix. Um, right. Uh, so we talked about the accumulator a little bit. We talked about the motor a little bit. Um, talked about torque curves. Talked about drivetrain. So let's talk about cooling. So like I stated before, the batteries output heat, but so does the motor. Uh, so does the motor controller. So does the BMS. These are just uh, these are the things that will output the most heat. Uh, if uh, if the electrical system has uh, Things like, uh, I don't know, some circuits that get really hot for some reason. There's some relays that get really hot. I don't know. Those are also things that you might have to, you guys might have to cool. Now, we opted in our design to, to water cool everything that's not the accumulator itself. Because, first of all, a lot of comp the, the companies offer a water-cooled version of their stuff, as well as an air-cooled version. But also, because uh, it's much easier to control water flow inside of an object than it is to control airflow around an object. Oh, yes. So Erica says that the BMS is called AMS in the rules. That's correct, because uh, in the rules, you don't have to use batteries. Like I said, you can use supercapacitors. So they called it the accumulator management system instead of the BMS. But in reality, uh, I highly doubt you guys will use um, capacitors. If you do, more power to you, but there's no reason why you should. And thus, it's, a, it's called a BMS. Anyways, um, it's much easier to control water flow around an object than it is to control airflow because air can get very turbulent in the back of a car. And if you're going to rely on that to cool your system, well, if you're idling, that's not going to help. If you're, uh, if you're going super quick, but uh, you have a big-ass aero package behind you, that might block a bunch of areas. So now you're competing, you have air competing for both aero and cooling. But if you have a water-cooled system, you can have a radiator on the side where you have nice laminar flow of air coming towards it. And yes, you have the front wing and all that, but that's much easier to, uh, to work to solve because the aero people work, are going to do a lot of simulations on the front wing anyways to understand how that airflow will become past the front wing. So you can design your radiators to, to fix that issue. Uh, we came up with a full cooling solution in the report. 
uh, with the what parts you should use. Um, if I had to change one thing, it would be the pump. Uh, I recommend uh, PC water cooling pumps, but you guys have to see if uh, there's enough, uh, it, it can surpass the pressure head of the system, which is, uh, it's doable. It's, it's not something very hard. A lot of the calculations were already done. They're all in the appendix and in the body of the report. But yeah, um, the cooling system for anything but the accumulator is uh, it's actually fairly trivial. It's, it's not very hard. But uh, it, the accumulator is what you guys will really, really, really have to focus on. Because that's the thing that, first of all, will be the hardest to cool. And it's the thing that will shut off the second any of those cells. Or actually, sorry, let me repeat. Uh, it will shut off the second any of the sensors uh, measuring the cells measures anything above 60 Celsius. So it's the hardest thing to cool, and it's the most critical thing to cool. And uh, this is where I think most of the whoever is taking care of the cooling system on the electric car will, will have to put in their work because the other stuff's done. And it's very important that you see it and you review it and you, you do your own calculations, but spend most of your time working on accumulator cooling. Uh, with that said, uh, you know, uh, you know, like, this is a very possible thing to do. Other teams have done it. Other teams don't have anyone smarter than we do. Um, so, you know, be be uh, confident with what you're what you're doing. the The report is a very good start. And yes, you have a lot of work to do, but it's all work that is surmountable. You've got uh, a lot of teams around you that are electric, like McGill and Western, uh, you've got the rules, like the, you can ask rules questions to FSAE. So uh, there's nothing really there. Uh, it's new stuff, but it's nothing really groundbreaking is what I'm trying to say. Um, I think that covers most of, if not all of the electric powertrain system. Is there anything you guys wanted to ask about specifically? Do most teams run single or multiple motors? Uh, I believe most teams run single motor for simplicity because you, you only have to control one motor, you only have to install one motor, you only have to maintain one motor. But I believe that the best teams out there run four motors, uh, one in each wheel. Uh, that has benefits like uh, uh, torque vectoring. So it, since each wheel is uh, has its own power source, when you turn, you can have the outside wheels uh, have more torque than the inside wheels, which helps your car turn without even having to turn the steering wheel very much. Uh, you can run things like uh, traction control, which means that you'll never you'll never uh, be slipping or anything like that. But the the amount of complexity and weight and uh, stuff that can go wrong increases four times, essentially. So is it always the best idea to go with a four motor system? I don't think so. I think you could be very competitive and perhaps even win with a car that only has one motor, because if you have four, you have four times the chance of failure. Uh, was the reasoning in implementing the motor, what's the reasoning of implementing the motor within the rear? That's a very good question, Josh. So uh, the idea of, OK, you always want the motor close to the wheels you're driving. That's just common sense. Imagine you're in your room, and uh, you, you put your desk on one end of the room and your chair on the other side. And then somehow uh, you have a wireless keyboard, and you're sitting on your chair. Why would you want to be so far away from the computer? It's impractical. Well, in a car, why would you put the motor so far away from the, from the, from the wheels you're driving? Because now you have to add a massive drive shaft. Now, that, this is speaking about race cars specifically. Road cars, you know, you have a rear-wheel drive car, but it's front-engined, and you have a nice, thick drive shaft. But that's just how it is. Uh, it's still 
more cheaper for some reason in the in the road car industry to have a front engine car and i'm sure that they did the the economical analysis and they figured that with the even with the weight with the excess weight and excess material it's still cheaper to build a front engine car than to build a a rear a mid or rear engine car that's uh you know a family sedan or whatever but in racing it doesn't make sense to add that extra weight so you put the motor near the wheels you're driving so now the question becomes why rear wheel drive why not front wheel drive well front wheel drive has its benefits but it also has uh big drawbacks in terms of racing the first and foremost is acceleration if the front wheels are accelerating you forwards but your car is going to tip back because of uh you know forward acceleration you'll have uh, a reaction where the you know you know when you're sitting in a car and you accelerate and your body kind of pushes itself against the seat whereas well, the whole vehicle the whole body of the vehicle is actually tipping up if you look at um uh, drag racing cars really powerful drag racing cars they they uh What's that called again? Uh, not tilt. They wheelie. They wheelie because uh, there's so much forward acceleration and so little weight on the front that the, that the whole thing flips up. Now imagine your front wheels are the ones that are driving your car and you accelerate and the front wheels lift off the ground. Well, now there's nothing driving your car. So then you, you, you fall back down. So in order to increase acceleration, you want your rear wheels to be the ones driving the car. Because they're, as you tilt up, not only do the front wheels not touch, but the rears not have more weight on them, which means they have more grip on them, which means you could put more force through them. So we want the rear wheels to run the car. Another important thing, uh, the center of gravity of the vehicle is a product of all the components being in a certain position. Now, let's say I have the, the motor in the rear at a certain height. The CG will be at a certain height as a result. Now let's say I put the motor in the front at the same height as the one in the rear. The CG won't change in height, but if the motor is now so much farther away from the CG than it was when it's in the rear, your yaw moment, sorry, your yaw inertia will change. So it'll be harder to, spit, to turn the car left and right because all the weight is now farther away from the center of gravity. Even though it's at the same height, it's farther away. So the car becomes a lot more sluggish. So your goal is to try and keep the weight as close as possible to the CG. And having the motor in the rear makes it closer than in the front because a driver, when they sit down, they have legs in front of them, but they don't have anything behind them, right? And you can't put the motor in your lap. You'll have a bad time. So that's why we want uh, 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 to put the motor in the rear. I hope that answered your question, Josh. Uh, can we do a rundown of the controller again? Okay, the controller is a box and it has an input voltage and current and it does an output voltage and current. Uh, the input comes from the accumulator, the output goes to the motor. The motor requires a certain amount of voltage. So the controller will supply that amount of voltage. The accumulator will be set up to supply a certain amount of voltage. It's important that the voltage of the accumulator going into the motor controller is as close as possible to the motor, uh, to, the, to the voltage exiting the motor controller to the, to the motor. Because even though the motor controller provides a correction if they're not equal, the bigger that, cor that the correction has to be, the more inefficient the motor controller becomes. So you lose energy going to the motor. Now, other than supplying a voltage, it also supplies a current. The motor needs a certain amount of current to spin a certain amount. So it asks the motor controller for that amount of current. The motor controller then asks the accumulator to supply that amount of current. That's, that's the whole job of the motor controller. Now, the way things ask each other is by the driver pressing on the gas. It sends a signal to the motor controller and through the team setup, the motor controller will say, okay, so he's pressing the, the gas pedal at 50%. 50% should mean, let's say, I don't know, uh, 70 amps. 
okay, so I'm going to send the motor 70 amps. Hey, accumulator, give me 70 amps. That's what the motor controller does. All right, well, if there's no more questions, uh, I think we're done. You guys can take a break and get ready for the uh, electrical meeting. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate your uh, presence.